Hello, EMF. Wonderful. So there is a large amount of material, uh, so I'm going to present a 30-minute talk on some context of living on the canals, some of the reasons why you absolutely should never consider it, and then I, if there is time, I will give you some of the reasons why people do in fact stay. So, this is a canal. Uh, these are essentially artificial waterways dug from uh, essentially 60 years before 1830. There are about 3,000 miles of inland waterway in the UK, depending on how you classify these things. And as we can see, the canal has a towpath. This here is the Grand Union Canal. Uh, the part of the benefit of the canal network compared to navigations was the creation of the pound lock, which is to say a way of raising or lowering boats, and most canals in the UK conform to one of two standards, even though there aren't any. Uh, a boat of about 55 foot narrow boat will fit anywhere on the network, but a boat of about 70 by 14 will typically fit on most of the bigger canals, say the Grand Union, the Kennet and Avon. These are where most most people on the canals are, and this here is part of the Hanwell flight in West London. So, to give us some context about living on the canals, I'm just going to give you a brief history. There is a lot more here. So, to start with, the canals were originally built essentially for taking very heavy things and very fragile things, so coal pottery. You're essentially competing with the turnpike system of the age, and this was a massive shift, essentially giving us 60 years of canal mania until, of course, 1830 arrives and the railways kick in. Since 1830, the canals have been in decline, which is quite impressive for a network to still be here 200 years later. The railways consistently took trade by hook and crook, essentially stealing customers, and in some cases, outright closing sections of canal. The competition to uh, continue shipping freight came down to essentially forcing families to live in these boats. Here we can see an example of a canal family living in the rear cabin of the boat here. The rest of the boat, of course, is full of cargo, and these boats are working day and night. Over time, trade drops off, and we come toward the 20th century. Here we can see the Grand Surrey Canal in South London, long since gone, but there are still vague bits of signage around bits like Camberwell, where you can see that the old park there is the basin. Uh, and so the canals essentially became this uh, legacy of the Industrial Revolution. They were places for rubbish, they were places for crap, really. Um, they, they didn't really exist in a useful uh, fashion. Now, in the 1940s, uh, a man called Tom Rolt took his wife and bought a boat called Cressy, and he was exploring the canals of the UK. And at this time, the, the system had, you know, your people who had been on the system for hundreds of years, but it had uh, massively declined in terms of usefulness. And so in 1946, I believe, Narrow Boat was published. Now, this book uh, brought together various people, including Robert Aikman, to found what was then known, or is still known, as the Inland Waterways Association. Now this is the organization that over the last hundred years has advocated for uh, preservation and restoration of the canal network. Now over the last 50, 60 years, they have successfully lobbied the government uh, with funding from the 70s and 80s to essentially reopen large sections of the canal. So things like the Kennet and Avon did not really exist in a functional sense until the 1990s. Sections like um, the Crick, no, Crick, not Crick, uh, well, one of the tunnels on the Grand Union, Blissworth, there we go, uh, was also reopened. And so the canal network began its ascendancy again, not for industry, but for leisure. At the time, there were two ways for you to get onto the water. You could have a hire boat and take your family away for a week or two. And this is still a fairly common thing. There are about a thousand hire boats on the canal network today. The alternative, of course, was to buy your own. Um, here we can see one of the more famous examples of uh, leisure boats or leisure boaters was the Springers. The Springer Engineering Company was a steel manufacturer. 
uh, who very wisely shifted into narrowboats because they made thousands of these things. And of course, this tells us something else we should know, that most of the boats on the canal today were built in the 1970s onwards. There are still a few hundred heritage boats that get restored, things like wood uh, and so forth, but very few of them today are actually upon the network. And so over time, the system has changed and a new law was required. So one of the, uh, <laughs> one of the interesting points about this was in 1995, the government passed the British Waterways Act. So this is the last bit, bit of big legislation. So I only post this massive wall of text simply because of how important this is. There have been people living on the canals, as I say, for maybe 200 years, and there are heritage interests to do with this. And of course, Tom Rolt and Narrowboat was advocating for cruising the canals to not stay in one place. Now, most boats in the world, or most canal or inland waterways uh, in the world, require you to have a mooring, which is to say a place to park more your boat. If you don't have that, most places will not let you keep that boat on the water. This is not true in the UK. So, this is where we get into sort of recent history. So, primary sources are hard to find, but essentially uh, the British waterways at the time were terrified this law wasn't going to pass. And so, a provision was essentially put in to provide for boats that did not have a mooring. And there were two requirements for this. And this is literally all the law says. A boat must be engaged in bona fide navigation, evidence of which is movement every two weeks. That's it. And now in 1995, of course, uh, things were different, things were cheaper, and of course things have changed. So, as I'm sure many of you are aware, house prices have massively shot up in the last 20, 30 years, and this has led to a massive influx onto the canal network. The uh, network itself was nationalised back in 1945, uh, well, before the war, before the war, and eventually, back in 2012, I believe, spun out into the new quasi-navigation authority, quasi-charity, quasi-trust, the Canal and River Trust. And they're responsible for about 2,000 miles of waterways. Not all of them. Things like the Thames are still managed by the Environment Agency, and there are other waterways, say the Way Navigation uh, in Surrey, I believe, which is run by the National Trust. So most of what I'm going to talk about is going to be to do with uh, the canals, the Canal and River Trust, but it's important to remember that uh, there are other waterways, there are other rivers, and uh, people are living on them. Another point to point out here is that Canal and River Trust are responsible for not only managing navigation legally, they are also required for provision of facilities. And this has been the mild issue where the influx of this new number of boaters, this third use as housing, has started to bring tensions about. So, some of these terms are pejorative in the boating community. So I'm only using them here just to kind of make it clear where the difficulty is, uh, is coming from. The law is, as, as I have just said, as long as you are engaged in bona fide navigation, which is an undefined term, you are within the law, and CRT have no right to deny you a license. However, uh, this has angered certain sections of the community because you essentially have a false distinction between those that stay in one area, vis-a-vis -vis the southeast or around Bristol, Oxford, very nice, useful places with, say, uh, you know, your community links, versus those that you know viewed the original. Uh, use of this, this, this law to mean people who explored the network, people who truly went out. Now, uh, as I say, this, this leads to this idea that there are somehow one group in the community that is um, bad. But this, this is one of those things which is why I wanted to give you all this context. The canals changed from industry, they changed into leisure, and as time goes by, they are now changing into housing. 
The reality is there are liverboards, people living on the canals, in all four of these categories. By my reckoning, and it is very hard to get data on this, there is somewhere between 20 and 50,000 people living on the canals and rivers uh, of the UK. Uh, whether they are continuous cruisers, which is going to account for maybe uh, 10, 15,000, but there are other people living in marinas, living uh, illicitly, as it were, on stretches of backs of rivers, places where uh, you can, frankly, just get away with it. Right. So uh, here we can see the canal network of the southeast. We are over here near Ledbury, and we can see the River Severn on the left-hand side. And my boat is currently in a delightful little... No, it's not in a delightful village. It's very near a village called Cheddington over on the Grand Union Canal. Now, I've put an arrow here to indicate what 20 miles is because one of the things that the Canal and River Trust uh, brought in as a de facto rule was that as long as you were moving every 14 days and as long as you were doing about 20 miles point to point a year, they would leave you alone. If you decide, for instance, to go more in central London and break down, uh, they will remove your boat. So it, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's not actually in law, but people do vaguely obey this. Now, uh, the reason I didn't cruise my boat here today is because, and this is very tiny text, I apologize, but from where my boat is to here on the River Severn would have been about 70 hours of cruising and 130 locks. So, you know, two weeks of solid movement. Um, now, what's quite interesting is, of course, is that we are now um, 150, 200 years on from this founding of the canal network, and we still have over 3,000 miles of waterways uh, in use. Now, uh, here we can see the canals and rivers of uh, London and the South East. So on the left-hand side, we can therefore see the Grand Union Canal, essentially one of the last big projects. Across the centre, we can see the Regents and the Paddington Arm. And on the right, we have the River Lee. These uh, four-ish waterways account for 20% of all uh, boaters on the network. So these are places that are relatively busy, to put it mildly. So the issues to do, to do with uh, essentially overcrowding are because of, of uh, this popularity. And again, we can see the 20 miles sort of indicated here showing this idea of you, where you're having to move. So here I've drawn some uh, sort of indicative lines indicating what would be a typical cruising pattern for a continuous cruiser. Uh, in, in these days. So these are sort of approximate 20 miles. Obviously people do more, some people do less, but these kind of show you that it's not actually as, uh, as annoying as it is. Uh, the orange line here was basically my plan, path, for about five years before, uh, before the event. Um, <laughs> uh, but I just wanted to highlight the point here that People have different cruising patterns, but because of the shape of the network, their patterns overlap at popular locations. So you can see that people on the River Lee still come through central London, those on the Grand Union still come in maybe to places like Little Venice. And you end up with vast density of boaters in these places. And if you've been to any uh, big city, say Bristol or London or Birmingham, you will see these boats uh, cheek by jowl. And this of course has led to overcrowding. This brings on to the kind of shanty town aspect of the canal network. Um, there, is, there is no driving license for a narrow boat. You can turn up, buy a boat, buy a license, and as long as your boat has a, uh, an MOT, as it were, a safety certificate, off you go. I literally drove off my boat having never driven a narrow boat in my entire life. It's interesting that the low cost of entry onto the network has brought a lot of people who don't really have an alternative anymore. So it's, it's one of these issues where the facilities that exist are being shared by thousands of people and those people uh, without the canals typically have nowhere else to go. Uh, and additionally, just going off of that shantytown aspect, places like central London, east London especially, there are a lot of boaters there. 
there's also a lot of crime. So theft, muggings, you even have whole boats being stolen, which given that they cruise away at three, four miles an hour is an impressive trick. Um, right. So I, I don't want to sugarcoat anything. I'm not going to present this idea that living on the canals is, is perfect and wonderful. Um, there are so many ways you can injure yourself. People die. Uh, whether it's going to be monoxide poisoning, smoke inhalation, drownings, bad wiring, fire, electrocution. These boats, as I say, were built in the 70s onwards as hire boats. Most of the network is people living in things that were never built as housing. The reality is, boats can sink. We can see here a hire boat on the far right has gotten trapped on the lip of the upper edge of a lock called the sill. And essentially, if you have water, you lower it down, the boat then ends up sinking rather quickly. Now, in this case, no one was injured, but people do, and it is not safe. The Victorians did not have a sense of health and safety. So I'll just point out that I've been on the cut now for, sorry, the cut being the canal, uh, for about seven years, and I have scars to prove it. Um, the other part of this, of course, is that you are living off-grid. Everything that you bring in, you have to bring out. This here is an LSAM, uh, and this is a cassette. This is my toilet. Um, every few weeks or so, this requires emptying, and one of the points about cruising your boat is that you are having to go to these facilities, whether they are bins, whether they are taps, whether they are the LSAM. Your life is dedicated to not only uh, keeping the boat afloat, but also managing the things that you need. Uh, and there's a lot of things that you have to keep on top of. Um, I, I won't show any more of this, but essentially uh, walking your cassette down the towpath is a time-honored boater tradition. Okay. Right, so I should probably show you. This is my boat. Uh, this is a 45-foot narrowboat with a BMC 1.8-litre engine. Uh, uh, my Lindy was built in 1994, and it's essentially uh, just a large amount of steel, some woodwork, and nowhere near enough insulation. Uh, you can also see here that the boat is not on the towpath side because as I was going to go set up a lock, my boat had very nicely decided to drift away. Uh, these are the kind of problems that you will face on a daily basis. So, just, just to give some numbers, but I, I don't, I don't want to get into too many specifics, if only because you're essentially asking how long is a piece of string. Uh, costs essentially break down into three, three costs, really. Capital costs in terms of buying your boat, upgrading it, buying solar panels, that kind of thing. The ongoing costs, things like your license, your boat safety, your gas, your coal, whatever it is that you need to survive, uh, you, you then have to be uh, getting it. Now, these ongoing costs will come down very much to what you consider to be a necessity, and this is true of all off-grid lifestyles. The more, the more you need or want the things that are on grid, the more pricey it is going to get. And of course, the unexpected costs. Uh, BOAT is of course an acronym. Does anybody know it? Bring out another thousand. Yes. <laughs> Things break. And I will show you examples of that too. So, it's, it's not surprising really, but the, the cost of entry onto the network is very low. Um, I bought my narrowboat for about £20,000. Uh, and this was essentially in what we would call the project uh, region. It, essentially, this is a euphemistic term for uh, a boat that has had no work done to it for a very long time. The, the more money you spend, the closer to new you can get, the more you can adapt it. Obviously, it'll also come down to the size and the shape of the boat that you want. And as I've mentioned, different canals have uh, different size requirements. Things like Dutch barges may be an attractive proposition, if only because they're attractive, but they will not get under some bridges. Uh, and of course, things like wide beam boats, these sort of giant floating apartments, they can't get down quite a lot of the network in the UK. So it comes down to where you're intending, uh, intending to be. In, in terms of running costs, uh, we'll get on to why this uh, is so variable, but essentially my running costs are about £300 a month for everything, and that includes going to the pub. The, the reality is it is more of a second job, and the more that you do yourself, 
the, the cheaper it will be. Big jobs, say repainting the steel, can run anywhere up to 10 to 20,000 pounds alone to hire the, uh, the expertise to actually go through it. So you find that a lot of boaters are very hands-on. If things break, you, uh, you, you learn how to fix them. So, of course, there is no such thing as a free lunch. Now, uh, when I bought my Lindy back in 2017, uh, I, thought, I thought I'd done enough research, you know, three years of solid work. I put together everything, I'd, I'd, I'd figured out what kind of engine I wanted, what kind of steel. But three days on board, I find slugs coming through my floor. It turns out the entire subfloor in the rear section of the boat had rotted away years ago, had the consistency of Weetabix. So here you can see the delightful setup of my toilet next to my fridge. Um, of course, you are on a boat, so when things break, you are there to, you need to fix it. So we can also see here me having to replace the engine mounts on the engine, because of course the engine has to line up with the propeller, and if they break, your, your engine is not doing anything useful. And so you end up throwing uh, tarp over things and getting on with things because they have to be done. Um, and because uh, it would not be a boat at all without passing on the one piece of advice, under no circumstances buy a boat without a survey. Just don't do it. The reality is a survey is to take the boat out of the water and assess the quality of the steel. You can, of course, get uh, smaller boats, river cruisers, yogurt pots. But for the vast majority of people, this, this advice is something that will cost you if you ignore it. So... Uh, my Lindy has relatively good steel, it was just everything else that was broken. So, in, in, terms, of, uh, in terms of the hard labour, some of the bigger jobs that have to be done are blacking, where the boat is taken out of the water here at Harefield Marina for me. And you can see it is a big job. Uh, my boat is about 14 metres long and this job has to be done every two or three years. The paintwork, the blue, this has to be done this summer, and that has to be done every seven or ten years. If you ignore a problem, you can get by for a while, and eventually something will break. And uh, that, of course, assumes you even know what you're doing. So, let me get on to sort of uh, obscure. This is my 1970s BMC engine. As you can see, it's in excellent condition. Um, <laughs> You will quickly either have to learn how to service an engine. <laughs> That's fine. I, my intention, by the way, is to sort of focus very much on all the reasons not to and then finish on at least some positivity. Um, so in terms, of, in terms of these costs, you're the one who is going to have to service your engine. And this is where we come on to the unexpected. Uh, it turns out that gearboxes require oil. Who knew? Um, so... <laughs> Uh, having uh, literally destroyed my gearbox, which was impressive, you go online, you find the manual for the thing, and you very much have to learn how to rebuild it, because the alternative is paying a thousand pounds for someone uh, in the country to send you a refurbished model. Everything is expensive. Finding good tradespeople is nearly impossible. But the reality is these, these uh, unexpected costs, they come from the vast majority of things that you need to know. These boats were not built with longevity in mind. The wiring on my boat was done by a crazy person. The plumbing was terrifying. Uh, the wiring to the engine was quite impressive. It literally had the starter feed line go from the batteries to an ammeter at the control panel two meters away and then back to the starter. That's hundreds of amps through a very thin cable. It's a wonder these things don't catch fire more often. Uh, but just as a reference to an earlier talk about uh, information that you can't find online easily, uh, Tony Brooks has an incredible website uh, with, frankly, incredible design, uh, giving you a lot of this information, essentially how you rebuild your engine, how you can do these things. Unfortunately, much of the information that you need these days is essentially locked behind uh, Facebook groups. So it's, it's one of those things where you kind of have to uh, uh, figure these things out. Uh, then we come to the actually sort of more milder aspects, essentially work from home. The main thing here to understand is that the internet is not uh, good across the canal network. 
no matter how good your antenna is, you are going to run into black spots and you will have to keep cruising. There are places where you cannot get solar because of the sun. And of course, this then leads us on to the most popular question that boaters always get asked, does it get cold in winter? Um, and, and the answer is yes, of course it does. But uh, the thing is, as long as you are able to keep a fire in, and as long as you've stocked up enough fuel, it's not actually that bad. It's essentially just a managing, management game. You keep on top of things, and uh, you can't really go too badly. But th this first year here, you can see I'd broken down in the middle of Southall, and I was literally carrying bags of coal back from Wicks <laughs> to keep warm. <laughs> so it's always good to plan ahead. Now, uh, I guess I'm going to speed up a little bit because we are running out of time here, but essentially I, I adapt to the circumstances of the seasons. If you want to have electricity in winter, you can either do what I do, which is go to the pub, or you can get a generator. The fact is a solar panel in summer will give you enough to run a fridge and everything else that you need, but most of the year it will not give you anything at all. Uh, and then we go on to the wider point. So it's, it's a lack of space. Uh, you know, having big things or having things that require uh, electricity, even things like washing machines, you have to find to put them somewhere. Uh, and you come down to a decision of, of what you have. And of course, you need to remember there are things that you need to have as, as a boater, whether these are tools, whether these are uh, uh, supplies like oil and replacement bits and bobs. Um, right. Since we are in the final few minutes, I will at least give you some reasons why people stay. So the first thing is, the canals are beautiful. It, I, I cannot describe to you how incredible it is to be in these places. This here is uh, a tiny branch of the Grand Union called the Wendover Arm. You can moor next to a cow field, you can see stars. It's incredible. Uh, for reasons beyond my understanding, um, my boat seems to attract cats. They're not my cats. Um, <laughs> every summer, without fail, they, you can see that they, they, they find it quite comfortable. Who knows? And, and of course, what I would be remiss to point out that, you know, cruising a narrowboat is hard work. And at the end of a long cruise, you can often find yourself in these remarkably uh, beautiful places. Canal side pubs really are some of the jewels of the network. Um, the primary reason I think that people stay on the network is purely to do with this slower pace of life. This idea that by needing less, by working slower, by connecting with the community that is there, you can have, you can have quite a sublime existence. Thank you for listening.